Greetings, welcome to The Dividing Line. We have a very important topic today. There is a, I guess we'd call it a meme, uh, even though memes have been reduced down to something as small as a, just a graphic or something like that. But uh, there is a uh, set of arguments going around, similar to, to back in the 1990s when, I think it was 1990s, uh, may have been a little bit after that, when you had the, uh, the West Wing episode where the president uh, attacked a Jewish person's views from the scriptures about homosexuality, and it, it went viral. It went everywhere. I mean, people were repeating this over and over and over again. You still see that even to this day. Um, last week, or maybe the week before, here on the program, we talked about the TikTok lady. We talked about uh, a, a video where a woman makes a claim of authority. She claims to have a master's of divinity degree and claims to be able to read Koine Greek and Hebrew and to have translated books of the Bible. And then she presents the exact same information that I'm going to give to you from someone else who claims to be a classics major and also have linguistic capacity. And it's the same material. Uh, it's exactly the same material. So it seems to be a, uh, a meme, a set of assertions, some type of article that is being distributed around the internet and it is specifically designed to catch individuals in making claims about what the Bible teaches about human sexuality, about homosexuality, and challenging those assertions in the most difficult way to respond to if you do not, in fact, have the background material really well at hand and know what the scriptures teach. And so I think this is very important for our young people for all of us, but especially our young people, to be aware of today because um, hopefully your children are homeschooled or in good, solid Christian schools, um, and, but even if they are, they're still going to be challenged by this material. And of course, they need to be passing this on to their children and their children's children and their children's children's children, and so this has to be material that is understood and, and uh, be able to present it in a confident fashion. So let me look at uh, this material. Uh, I'll put it on the screen. This is from someone named uh, Fairy Goth Mother. Um, not Callan, at not Callan is uh, her name. If you challenge her, she will block you immediately. She, I, I, I put one tweet uh, in response that said, this is, this is simply from a scholarly perspective, laughable. And I was, I was blocked within uh, about two minutes, I would say, of when I first encountered this. I had to uh, go through the back door to find uh, a way of uh, saving this stuff for you. But I don't talk about my religion much because I don't think that's something you should shove down others' throats. But the Bible has been severely mistranslated to fit bigots agendas, and that needs to be debunked, a thread. So uh, you, you shouldn't shove things down people's throats, but I'm going to shove this down your throat by starting with my conclusion that my data will never actually substantiate. <laughs> so um, we will not be teaching you how to recognize really, really, really bad arguments in this program specifically, but this is a, 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 a telltale sign. When you start off with your conclusion, your conclusion is meant to create um, emotional heat and you never actually get around to actually substantiating what you, what you asserted, but that's very common in social media today. So, so for those of you who don't know, I'm a classics major! Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. <laughs> I don't know that that means she has a degree or anything else, but I'm a classics major. This means I study ancient Greek and Roman religion and the beginnings of Christianity. All original translations of the Bible were in Greek, so that's how we know how to translate it into English. Um, I don't even know what that last sentence is supposed to mean. Uh, the New Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Uh, there are about 12 chapters in Aramaic. The New Testament was written in Koine Greek. So none of the translations of the Bible. Now, I, 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 okay, I'll take that back. The Greek Septuagint translation of the Old Testament is in Greek. That's true. But you don't have a Greek translation of the Greek New Testament. That doesn't make any sense. Um, so all original translations of the Bible were in Greek, so that's how we know how to translate into English. 
Uh, there's <laughs> this does not strike me as an individual who really, really knows what they're talking about, but it's the internet. The problem here is ancient Greek is a difficult language to translate because some words don't appear frequently and can be debated like the word arsenokoitai. Now, arsenokoitai is the plural of arsenokoites. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 1 Timothy chapter 1 in regards to homosexuality. Um, we'll talk about it more in just a moment. Uh, we talked about it last week, but we want to make sure everyone fully understands where this term came from. But again, there is confusion in the statement. Um, this communicates the idea that, well, there's just a lot of words we don't know what they mean. Well, that's not nearly as true of Greek as it is in Hebrew. There are certain terms in the Hebrew language because of its antiquity where we don't have um, any kind of uh, ability to say, oh, here's another language over here. Here's another language. This is a cognate term here, a cognate term there. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with something that's nearly 3,000 years old, uh, that's, that's, of course, understandable. Uh, but Greek, especially Koine Greek, we have all the papyri. We have, we, have, we have many, 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 many volumes of material that we can go to. And so it's, it's pretty rare to run into a true hapax legomena. Hapax legomena is a term that appears only one time in the body of a, a, a piece of literature. So, for, for example, there are, uh, hapak, there are hapax legomena in the New Testament, but almost always you can find them being used outside the New Testament in contemporary Greek literature. Um, so the older the language is, the more difficult that is because we have just so much less to draw from. Uh, Koine Greek, the common Greek of the day of Jesus, um, not too many, not too much of, uh, of an issue there. Um, then she says, like the word arsenokoitai, which is what English speakers decided meant homosexual, then in all caps, but it does not. Now, if you're going to say, but it does not, uh, then you're going to surely be prepared to enter into the foundational reasons why it has been translated in that way. And remember, the term homosexual is an English term. What does arsenokoite mean? It means men with men in bed. It means coitus. It means intercourse between men. And we will demonstrate from the, Hebrew, uh, from the Greek translation of the Old Testament, called the Greek Septuagint, that this is the background behind Paul's words. There really isn't any question about this. Uh, this isn't really something to be that, that, that can be debated. I'm, I'm well aware that there is a tremendous amount of misrepresentation, there's a tremendous amount of literature being produced today uh, that seeks to bring confusion to this subject, but there really isn't any meaningful reason. If it was any other subject than this, no one would really have any problems with it. Uh, that's, that's what's important. But uh, she claims, but it does not. So arsenokoitai appeared several times in the Bible, and when making the Revised Standard Version in 1946, because there's lots of different versions for those who don't know, the translators decided to make the word indicated homosexuality to push their own agenda. Now, if you're going to make that kind of claim, then you're, you're going to need to, to back that up by providing some kind of evidence uh, in the material itself that would uh, document uh, where, where this bias is coming from, um, that kind of thing. There are four different screenshots, so I need to blow it up so you can, so you can see it. All right. So there's their push their own agenda. What is really being described is pedophilia. Now, again, this is very, very common. Uh, we dealt uh, with this argument repeatedly in the context of the book that we wrote. Uh, 20 years ago now. It was written, well, it came out 20 years ago. It was probably written 21 years ago now. Uh, Jeff Neal and I wrote The Same Sex Controversy. And so we deal with this idea uh, in, uh, in the book. Uh, but notice the assertion, what is really being described as pedophilia, a line typically translated as men should not lie with men for it is abomination, should actually read as men should not lie with young boys for it is an abomination. Now, 
immediately we see the depth of ignorance of this particular individual and how bad this information is, which unfortunately the vast majority of people are not going to look to for themselves. But you'll notice that what is being quoted there is from sort of paraphrastically from either Leviticus 18 or Leviticus 20. We'll be looking at them uh, in, in, a, in a moment. Uh, but that doesn't use the term arsenokoites because that was written in Hebrew. What we will see is that the Greek translation uses arsenos, which means male, and koitain and koimethe uh, to refer to sexual intercourse between males and females or between males and males in this, in, this, in this instance. But that was written in Hebrew. It wasn't written in Greek. She doesn't seem to understand what the sources are. She's either going from memory or just you know, cutting and pasting. Who knows? I, 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 I don't know. But there is nothing in the Hebrew or in the Greek of Leviticus 18 or 20 that in any way limits what's being said to little boys or to pedophilia or anything like it. Uh, just simply nothing there at all. That this is a assertion without a foundation. In older translations of the Bible in other languages such as German, now let's stop immediately and of course the German translation is not an ancient translation. Uh, we know that Martin Luther translates the New Testament while he's hiding uh, from the emperor uh, after the Diet of Worms. And uh, so that's what she's making reference to. But that's irrelevant to the issue. Uh, just when the, as the TikTok lady did in the video we looked at last week, irrelevant to the issue. What translations have done that were done 1,500 years after Paul writes 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This again, this plays on the ignorance of the vast majority of the public today as to how translations come into existence, uh, the history of the text, all of these things. People, people don't know where the Bible came from. They don't know that it was written by 40 different authors over 1,500 years in three different languages. And, and <clears throat> the vast majority of Americans especially have never translated from another language outside of maybe a, a semester of Spanish or something, or, or fumbling through at the drive-thru trying to get something ordered, something along those lines. Uh, so you can get away with this kind of misrepresentation. What is found in an English trans a, a German translation, English translation, Italian translation, Latin translation that, that is done 1,500 years later has interest to historians, but it cannot have any meaningful interest to the actual meaning of the term when the author used it. What did Paul mean when he wrote to the Corinthians? What did Paul mean when he wrote to Timothy? What would those readers have understood as they saw those, those letters on a piece of papyrus and they saw arsenicoitai and a whole list of sinful behaviors? What would they have understood? In older translations of the Bible in our language, such as German, Martin Luther's 1534 copy to be exact, the word arsenokoita is translated as nabenschender, which literally means boy molester. This didn't change to homosexual in German translations till the 70s or 80s. Well, that is true. It's irrelevant, but it's true. So what did, uh, what did Luther understand? And the more important question is, what was the state of lexical study at the time that Martin Luther is hiding from Charles at the Wartburg Castle in the early 1520s, because it's a 1534 edition. Um, but the, work, the New Testament work, primarily, the, most of his time in translation work after that is done with the Old Testament because it's much longer, much harder, and he's not nearly as good with Hebrew as he was with Greek. But the point is, uh, does the understanding of a particular Augustinian monk in 1534 determine the source of Paul's understanding 1,500 years earlier? No, it does not. It's an interesting fact, but it's obviously being presented as some kind of...
somehow Luther had access to some ancient uh, element of the language that we don't have today, which is simply not the case. This literally only happened because the company who owns the NIV edition of the Bible paid for the 1983 translation of the German Bible to say homosexual instead of child boy molester. American Bible makers paid, literally paid for propaganda to be made saying homosexuality was bad. Now, again, we saw this uh, last week, uh, this, uh, well, conspiracy theory. Never any foundation, never any uh, substantiation provided whatsoever at all for this kind of assertion. And again, it ignores the reality that terms such as, for example, homosexual is a modern term. And we, we define it in the modern context. It's English that we're talking about as translate the meaning of the ancient text. And so there's this assumption that Bible translators are terrible, horrible people. It's funny. You've got this assertion here. But what's the King James assertion all the time? That the NIV, because of mom, was soft on homosexuality and tried to change the terms. <laughs> so you've got both sides coming up with uh, some kind of, of idea of a conspiracy theory without ever providing any foundation for it whatsoever or even arguing about it. American English versions of the Bible had made this change in 1946 after the 20s and 30s when gay rights groups began to form. People made this change as a political and social opposition to homosexuality since it was still a taboo subject and illegal in most cases. So here's someone who's gone to your local leftist community college and has been fed a line. And they're just simply believing what they've been told by their professors. They don't, they don't check it out. They don't, they don't go... But you'd have to be able to substantiate that with lexical studies, and you'd have, to, you'd have to look at who the translators were and what articles did they write and what evidence do you have uh, that this is actually what was driving the, the translation committees, especially the RSV committee and those committees like that. No, you don't have any of that. You just simply, you're making up history as you go. You're just like, well, you know, my professor said it, and I just believe my professor. The, the people who made this change did it to push their own agenda of hate and discrimination. See, that works real well uh, today when you have an entire generation that has now been raised on the idea that everybody in the past was nothing but hate-filled, discriminating bigots. And so this, this is simply meant to push all of the emotional buttons but you'll notice, so far, we haven't had any lexical sources cited. We haven't had anything from antiquity. We haven't had anything that actually makes for meaningful biblical scholarship at all. Because it's quite obvious that the people writing this stuff don't know anything about it or don't care anything about it. Uh, not because it was how it was meant to be translated, which we haven't been told about. They took a difficult word and bent the meaning just enough to fit what they wanted, and then that translation was sent to the masses. And so this is, this is, again, it's similar to what you'll find on um, uh, Facebook or Twitter or places like that where uh, you end up uh, with this idea of the monks, you know, uh, the monks in, and they've got their, their, you know, their hoods on and they're running around choosing what's supposed to be in the Bible and all the rest of this kind of stuff. Um, so anyway... Uh, 1946, a lot of our grandparents were just born or young. Thanks a lot. That was only 20 years before I was born. Uh, less than 20 years. Um, and uh, in fact, I was pretty close to you, Rich. Anyways, and this is the translation they grew up with. They, as well as all subsequent generations, have been fed a lie to promote hate. Oh, that, this is a great conspiracy theory. So you can, you can, you can dismiss anything the Bible says about the subject of sexual morality as, a, as based on mistranslation, and a culture of hate. That's, that way you don't have to argue this. That's why you, that, that way you don't have to do debates. Uh, that's why this woman blocked me a matter of minutes after I challenged this silliness, um, is because they don't do debate. Because this, kind of, this, this is just all assertion. This isn't argument. We all need to learn 
all adults, and we need to pass it on to our children. We need to learn how to identify what is an argument and what is merely a string of assertions. Argument follows logic. Argument seeks to make a statement and provide evidence in, in support of the statement. This is just a bunch of statements, assertions, without any logical conclusion to be made of them at all. The Bible literally says, love all of God's creation no matter how different someone may be from you. I would like to see that because it says literally. We all know that that's not what literally means today. That term has taken on a new meaning. But the Bible literally does not ever say that uh, anywhere. So why would God's book say homosexuality is a sin? It says things like murder are a sin. Oh goodness, wait till they start redefining murder. But how does that equate? It doesn't. It equates it to pedophilia. Now, again, not only is she misspelling pedophilia, uh, but have we seen the only evidence whatsoever that has been presented here that connected what the Bible says to pedophilia was the assertion followed by one German translation done by Martin Luther in 1534. That's it. How about, de how about getting out you know, something called a lexicon? How about looking at the specific verses? No, you don't get any of that. You just have the assertion because emotions work better with mere assertions than they do with argumentation. Argumentation tends to lessen emotion because it requires your mind to focus upon facts rather than upon feelings. So in our day, that's to be dismissed. You don't want facts, you want feelings. And that's exactly what we're getting here. It's sad that this mistranslation is what everyone seems to know because it was shoved down everyone's throat and it gives Christian religion a bad name because like most other religions, it's not a bad thing. It can be very positive, but the people who misuse it are seen more. Hate and fear are very strong things. Religious text is a great way to spread that because people wholeheartedly believe what's written down. So if you can convince people something is bad because it comes from the good book, you get people who agree with you more easily. The Bible also doesn't say to hate immigrants or those who look different from you. It says love and accept them as your own. So I literally don't understand how so many Christians find it okay to be racist. You're literally not following your own instruction manual. Anyway, people who try to... Notice you've got to throw in the whole, you know, the whole thing while you're at it. And obviously, the Bible specifically does condemn any kind of race-based hatred. The problem is the biblical definition of racism is not the modern definition of racism. Anyway, people who try to use the Bible or their religion to hurt people and be bigots are not real Christians. So if you don't agree with this, the greatest Bible translating scholar ever to live, um, then you are just simply a bigot. And we're, we're all seeing this. This is, this is how everything works now. You disagree with me? You're a bigot. That's it. And you need to be fired. I'm going to call your boss and have you fired. Or I'll go on social media and say your, your company hires bigots. That's how it works now. Total cancel culture. They can't, can't argue their point, but they will cancel you. They just want some kind of high ground and feel like they've got some splendid afterlife. If they were real Christians, they wouldn't be such terrible people. And if you also want re references to the places Ar Arsene Koitai has mentioned in the Bible, my sources, including my awesome professors who brought this up to me and are fluent in ancient Greek, or any other info, please DM me. I'm happy to share. Just DM me. Uh, and of course, there were all sorts of uh, you know, comments and, oh, this is so wonderful, and this is just so great, and, and man, I had no idea, and you're so smart, and all that kind of, uh, all that kind of rot there. All right, so once again, I think it's very, very important that Christians understand the reality of what the scriptures actually say, and I've, I've said for years, what you need is a full-orbed understanding of creation in scripture. Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, his teaching on God creating male and female. This is good. This is the way God created them from the beginning. This is the family, male and female, husband and wife, father, mother, children. This is the most important uh, social structure. And when you break that down, you destroy mankind as a whole, which is exactly what we're seeing happening right now 
uh, in what's, what remains of Western culture. So we should not be focused solely upon the quote-unquote six clobber passages, as they have been called. There are more than that, but there are six specific passages that unquestionably refer to the issue of homosexuality. And, of course, the homosexual uh, apologists have an entire range of excuses, and they are excuses, uh, that they use to try to get around these particular texts. But it's very, very important for all of us to understand what the Bible actually does say, both positively and negatively on this subject. So let's begin back in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. And once again, I know I went over this last week, but I'm doing this in just one place with all that as the lead in so that when you encounter this stuff, at the very least, you can link to this YouTube video for as long as it's up or wherever, end, wherever it ends up being posted, uh, and time index it and say, here, here is a complete refutation um, from someone who's taught these languages for decades, uh, not someone who goes, oh, I'm just so thankful for my professors, uh, saying that what you're being told is uh, complete bunk. Leviticus 18.21, let's just go back, this is, Leviticus 18 is a section that deals with the issue of the sins of the peoples that inhabited the land of Israel before Israel comes in and takes possession of the land. And in fact, at the end, it's going to say that because they did all these things, the land spewed them out, vomited them out. And so this is, this is what the people in the land did um, even before you have Moses coming along with the law. So this, this means that this element of God's law is, is revealed in nature itself. It is, is a reality on that line. So verse 21, Neither shall you give any of your offspring to offer them to Moloch, nor shall you profane the name of your God, I am Yahweh. When you have the term L-O-R-D in all caps, that is the divine name, the Tetragrammaton Yahweh. Then verse 22, you shall not lie with a male as one lies the female. It is an abomination. It is an abomination. So let's, let's go over here to the board and uh, see how this game was won. Uh, no, uh, here is your text, verse 22. Here is Kai, no, 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 no. Oh, sorry about that. Shields up. <laughs> Sorry, what that looks like. Chi meta arsenos. Now, arsenos is simply the word for a male. It is a man. U koi methe. This is to go to bed with. Koitain, from which we get coitus, the sex act. Gunaikos. A female, from which you get gynecology, for example, gunaikos. So this is your normal term in the original language for female. This is your normal term for male. Now, why is it important? Because when you look at koimethe and koitain, and you put these two terms together, the natural reading of the text is that you're talking about sexual intercourse between adults. What's being referred to, you shall not lie with a male as one lies with the female. As one lies with the female is the natural sexual intercourse. There's nothing about pederasty here. There's nothing about children. Nothing about pedophilia. Nothing at all. The natural meaning of the words would tell us what we're talking about here. We're talking about a sexual act between males that would be patterned on the sexual act with a female. And this is a bedelugma, or in the Hebrew language, 
this is an abomination is the term that normally is translated uh, that particular term. And again, this is, this is in the description of the people before, who lived in the land before they came into the land. So this is the pagan people. And it is described as an abomination, an abomination. Now, why not look at the Hebrew? Well, because uh, the issue that's being brought forth here is about the New Testament use of arsenokoites. I just want you to notice something. Arsena, here's arsenos, koites, koitein. So these are the two constituent elements of the one word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 6 and 1 Timothy chapter 1. It is not used in Romans chapter 1. And Romans chapter 1 is clearly talking about homosexuality, as we will see. But the point is that you see these two terms being used here. Now, that, as I said, is the, the text as far as Leviticus 18 goes. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 20. We'll go back to verse 12. Uh, so you'll notice, again, this is in the context of sexual behavior. If, a, if there is a man who lies with his daughter-in-law, so what is lies with? There it is again, koimethe, to lie with his daughter-in-law. Uh, both of them shall show you put to death. They have committed incest. What is incest? Okay, is that, is that a, a sexual uh, issue? Uh, obviously, it is. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. So that's the context of the law now being given to Israel in Leviticus chapter 20. If there is a man who lies with a male as those who lie with a woman, both of them com have committed a detestable act. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. So you'll notice there was no uh, penalty in Leviticus 18 because this was the sins of the people before them. Now you have the Mosaic penalties being attached to these behaviors. Verse 13, if there is, there's koimethe again, remember, we have, here's, they're the exact same, even the exact same form, the Greek Septuagint. Meta arsenos, exactly like Leviticus chapter 18. Koitein Gunaikos. Again, this is identical to Leviticus chapter 18. So you have arsenos, and look at this here. Arsenos koitain. Now they, that it was separated uh, back in, in Leviticus uh, 18. But arsenos koitain, arsenokoites. That's where it comes from. And there have been a few who've tried to argue against that. The vast majority do not. Even homosexual scholars recognize that this is the source of Paul's terminology. And if it is, that brings in the entire discussion of Paul's understanding of the abiding moral validity of the law. And this is a weak area for any evangelicals, unfortunately, uh, but it is very clear that Jesus never said the law is bad, the law is wrong. He said, I've come to fulfill the law. It was the goodness and perfection of the law that led Jesus to the cross because that law tells us what sin is and that's why he gives his life in sacrifice. And yet, as we will see, the Apostle Paul will demonstrate that this moral element of the law continues in his own day. And he makes that very, very plain in how he presents uh, his position. So, once again, we have men, we have women. There is nothing here whatsoever about children. You had in the previous verse, you had a man who lies to his daughter-in-law. But there is nothing here at all uh, about 
pedophilia, pederasty, anything whatsoever in this, in this text at all. Instead, you have men engaging in sexual relationship with women, but they do it with another man. This is homosexuality. Um, there's nothing here also commonly said, yeah, that was just about uh, cultic uh, legal stuff in the temple and priests and things like that. This is talking about the entire people of Israel. This is talking about the entire people of Israel. Uh, so here you have, and so just, just mark this down, arsenos koitain, arsenos koitain. Put them together, you have arsenokoites, which is the term that was being discussed um, in the previous material that I was reading from. So let's move over to the texts themselves. And I, I'm going to go ahead and start with, with 1 Timothy. Because uh, when, I, when I discussed this uh, with my daughter on her show, she was um, blown away by what you see when you step back and honestly seek to understand what is being said by Paul uh, when he uh, speaks to uh, Timothy. So notice, uh, for some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, wanting to be teachers of the law, which is one term, nama didaskaloi, law teachers. They want to be teach law teachers, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. But we know that the law is good. We know, oidemen de hati kalas hanamas. We know the law is good. If, if one uses it lawfully, can you abuse the law? Oh goodness, yes. Legalism, justification by works, all these things. But is there a danger because it can be misused one way that you can go the other direction? Yes, all through Scripture. You're always called to that balance between the antinobian who jumps off this side and the legalist who jumps off that side. It is always a matter of maintaining the proper balance and a recognition of what it means to use the law lawfully. So to use the law, but use it lawfully. Use it in the proper fashion. Realizing the fact that law, verse 9, is not made for a righteous man because for a righteous man, the law is not made. But for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane. Now, let's stop for a moment because there's going to be a progression here. If you were a believer who knew the Old Testament well, and that should describe all believers, and especially knew the Ten Commandments, then you would start looking at this and you would go, well... Uh, lawless and rebellious, ungodly and sinners, unholy and profane. That's a violation of the first table of the law. There is a rebellion against God. There's, there's a rejection of his ways, things like that. But then you would go, for those who kill their fathers and mothers. Oh, wait a minute. There's a commandment, isn't there, about fathers and mothers. For murderers. Well, that's the next commandment. Paul, I know what you're doing. You're going through the Decalogue. You're going through, you're using the law lawfully. And so it says for unholy and profane, those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers. And what's the next commandment? Well, let's take a look at it here. Let me see, make sure we've got it high enough here that I can turn the notes on. Shields up. Got to turn that off. So what is this lawful use? Well, we, we have 
pornois. You should not commit adultery. Pornaya, especially as Jesus uses it, has very, a very wide range of meanings. Very wide range of meanings. It's all sexual sin. And so as Paul makes application of the law and shows us how to use it lawfully, notice what he does. You have, you have immoral men is the 1977 NASB translation of pornois. And it is, it is a little hard to just translate that by only one term because it's, it's talking about the sexually immoral and there's all kinds of sexual immorality. But look at the word that follows it. What word follows it? Brother Rich wanted to answer that question himself. Arsenikoitis. Arsenikoitis. There's our term. There's our term. And it appears right before... What's the rest of, what's the rest of what we have here? Kidnappers, liars, perjurers, you know, taking the Lord's name in vain, you shall not steal. Many people feel that stealing there is first and foremost in regards to man stealing, things like that. So what do we see in Paul, the, the inspired apostle? And I'll tell you right now, you know what you're going to get in response to this? From the liberals? Paul didn't write this. That's what they're going to say. Uh, people like Bart Ehrman and others function on a minimalist Pauline canon, which means they only believe there's about seven of the epistles uh, that are credited to Paul that he actually wrote. Paul didn't write this. That's what they're going to do. Now, again, what do they base that on? Well, well, they base that on vocabulary and primarily their own predilection to what they think the early church was like, the Bauer hypothesis. It's, it's incredibly circular reasoning, uh, but it's out there. And again, you go to the most dangerous place on the planet for a Christian called the Christian bookstore, uh, you'll find all sorts of commentaries on the shelves that will be telling you the exact same thing. Okay? So, what does that mean? That means right here you have an inspired apostolic interpretation of sexual sin that specifically includes homosexuality. We saw where it came from, arsenokoitis. It comes from Leviticus 20. That's the closest. I mean, the two terms are right there. Leviticus 18 as well, especially Leviticus chapter 20. We saw it, and it's connected to sexual sin. Nothing here about pederasty about pedophilia. There's nothing about anything in the, in the context that would, that would give you any consideration of this whatsoever. It's just not there. But it is very plain that the apostle sees this as fitting into the moral law against sexual immorality. And so there you have it. So, the other text uh, that oh, I can, uh, I'm a little scared to try that, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to give it a shot. Uh, I'll just do it over here. It's a little bit, a little bit easier for me. And, but I, I bet you, I bet you it would work over there. I bet you it would work real well. A little faster this way. All right. First Corinthians chapter six. Very, very important. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, let, let's just be honest. The vast majority of the people we're talking about and talking to the woman that we were reading that material from, they don't believe this. They don't know that. Well, they do know that, but they suppress it. Uh, do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Or they would totally redefine what righteousness is from a biblical perspective. Do not be deceived. This, I don't know how many times, I should look it up, but I don't know how many times Paul says that. Do not be deceived. Do not be led astray. That means there are going to be people who will try to lead you astray. 
And then he starts working through, hmm, Pornoy. Seen that one before, haven't we? So fornicators, adulterers, those engaged in sexual sin. Idolatry, idolaters. The uh, adulterers, moikoi. Then you have this phrase, utamalakoi, uta arsinakoitai. All right, right there. Now, malakoi literally means soft. And so there are scholars and there are translations that would say that what you have here is a reference to effeminacy. Um, there's a lot of that these days. Uh, we are being told that being a man is toxic masculinity. Um, and so we have, I don't know, if you watch almost any fashion show today, <laughs> I don't watch fashion shows, I can assure you, but they pop up on the feed and you're just like, uh, that's Malakoy. That's big time Malakoy right there. And then we have, of course, our term arsenokoitai. So there are translations that say effeminate and homosexuals. The ESV simply says homosexual. You count, you count the, the words and you're like, uh, did they skip something? Did they just not translate Malakoy? No, here's the reasoning. And I think it has strong backing to it. Actually. Is that what you have here in these two terms Right here, right here. In those two terms, what you have here are the active and passive participants in male homosexual activity. The uh, submissive and the dominant. I won't go any more into that, but I think you can figure the rest of it out for yourself. Um, which would mean Paul has a full understanding of what is involved in this particular situation. He says, he goes on, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. But notice, it's, I always want to emphasize this. I don't really have the time to, but I just want to emphasize this. And such were some of you. Such were, oops, unfortunately, I got caught there uh, because... This one didn't, didn't scroll. There we go. Now it's up on the screen high enough to see. Very, very important. One little word right here. Were. Not are. Such were some of you. But, adversative, you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. That's past. So this means that there were people who were Malakoi who had been saved, who had been Arsenokoitai, who had been saved. Those people who say there's no salvation for these things, they, they, they have to do headstands, try to get around what's, what's here. And there are no textual variants that deny that that's a past tense. There are no present tense versions. None of them say such are some of you. All right? So what do we have then? We have clearly from the apostle... of what is found in Leviticus chapter 20 being applied in the church age as sin. But, of course, there is one other text to look at that I, I think we would be um, remiss if we did not add this in. I will, I will be brief, but I think it's important in light of uh, what is being said these days. Of course, Romans chapter 1. Does not use arsenokoitai, but this is the same apostle. This is the same writer who writes 1 Corinthians. And that is, that is considered by everyone that I know of as a Pauline epistle. Um, and hence, the use of 1 Timothy is quite consistent with that. And so you have the same apostle saying, Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie 
and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. And so you have the great exchange of the truth of God for the lie. This is what idolatry does. It is at the root of all of human rebellion against God. And so you have this description. And when you get to verses 26 and 27, what you have is homosexuality presented to us as an example. This is not, as has been misrepresented by many people of late, this is not uh, a situation where you have some kind of a vice list and homosexuality is just thrown in there along with all the rest, even though that's sort of what you have in First Timothy chapter 1, but <laughs> that's straight out of the Decalogue, so that you want to be careful. This is an example. The, Paul, the, the, the Apostle Paul uses homosexuality as an example of the great exchange. He's going to get the vice list later on. That's what the rest of the chapter is about. But right now, what he's saying is this twisting of the creator-creation relationship is so strong that it actually impacts where we are as human beings at the most basic level. You want to see this? For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. I think that I take gar thelaila, thelai, out tone. Therefore, even their women, now it's interesting, their women, for even their women exchange, that's the term that's been being used elsewhere, exchange the natural use for that which is against nature. Now, again, I've seen people do handstands. Well, you know, Paul says long hair is against nature too, so you know, this doesn't really mean anything. What do you think he's talking about? Numerous homosexual scholars have admitted this is plainly a discussion of homosexuality. And in fact, this might be the only place in the entirety of the canon of Scripture where female lesbianism is re being referred to. But the point is that there is a specific word for woman being used, it is an exchanging, that's what connects it to what came before, the exchange of the natural use, that which is against nature. This is echoing Leviticus 20 once again, very plainly. And so for that which is unnatural, and in the same way also, likewise, I'm going to pull this up a little bit. In the same way also, notice what he says. Men, there it is again, arsenos, abandoning the natural use, that's what was up here, natural use of the woman. What is the natural use of the woman? This is sexual intercourse between a male and a female. That's natural use of the woman. Here's what's important. Look at that term. I'm going to see if I can do something here. Oh, yeah. I like it. I like it. I brought it up over here because I'm, once I've got the notes up there, I'm drawing on it, I can't do it there. Uh, notice. Here's your term. Ek kayo is your, is your base. To blaze out, to be inflamed to be inflamed. So they burned in passion one for the other. They burned with passion ice alelus one for another. Why is that important? Because what have we already heard? This is... This, you silly fundamentalist Christians, when are you going to just do some reading? This is all about the, the Roman rich who would have, man, have boy slaves. And so this is, this is pedophilia again. This is pederasty. This is, 
This is, uh, maybe it has some, some economic aspects to it, uh, but it has nothing to do with committed, loving relationships. That's the big thing now. This is, we're not talking about committed, loving relationships, and the reason we're not talking about it is because the apostle did not believe in such a thing. Would never have even crossed his mind. Would never even crossed his mind. That's why we're talking about it. Ice, alelus, toward one another. This is mutual. This is men with men. This is as clear a description of homosexual sexual behavior as you can get. This isn't one person dominating another person in a sense of rich, slave type of situation. Ice alelus. Look at it. Translate it. No one ever does. Well, of course, the Orthodox do. They burned in their desire toward one another. Arsenes and arsen, ars, arsesen. Right there. Got to find it for our, all my scribbling on the board. <laughs> Arsenes and arsesen. Men with men. Not men with boys. Men with men. M mutual lust and desire for one another. This is homosexuality. There's any question about it. None. None. And it's described, men with men committing indecent acts. Remember, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but wow, I just realized, I think this year marks 20 years since I debated Barry Lynn on this subject. I think it was 2001. I think it was. Right. 2001. Look it up. The only reason you can watch it is because uh, the, the, they, now it's called the Alliance Defending Freedom, but Alliance Defense back in the day uh, defended us when Barry Lynn tried to suppress the videotapes of the debate that we did 20 years ago uh, on this very subject. I think he has passed away, if I recall correctly. I think so. I think so. Anyway, uh, I, there is a classic clip on YouTube where I am cross-examining Barry Lynn on the basis of the Greek New Testament as to what shameful acts are. This is an ACLU attorney, the head of the, freedom of, of the uh, se uh, American Separation of Church and State. ACLU attorney, popular on, on television back then. He was on all the time. Just watch it. He spins in circles. He cannot come up with an answer. Badly misinterpreted this text to try to get around what it says. There's no question. We need to have a deep foundational understanding of what we're talking about here. You need to be convinced of what Scripture is teaching to give an answer for the flood absolute flood. See, right now, we can still get the word out. But we all know that time's coming to an end. Now is the time to download presentations like this and put them on jump drives and put them in safe places and in anti-static bags and things like that. Transcribe them in, in, in printed form. Ooh. Something to be able to get the truth through to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation after that. Because right now there are forces at work that want to completely control the flow of information and they are not honest forces by any stretch of the imagination. They will pervert the truth. Hopefully this has been helpful to you in understanding what Scripture says about this subject. All right. So I want that to be a segment unto itself. Um... Maybe the uh, dividing line clips, guys, highlights, guys, will put that one together for us. Um, I think it would be most useful. Uh, but there were a few other things that I wanted to uh, try to get to uh, on the program today. Let me see if I can uh, pull them up here real quickly. Um, actually, uh, I wish there was a way I could look at stuff without necessarily throwing everything up <laughs> On the, on the screen uh, at the same time. 
Uh, but uh, boy, there's just so many things to, to look at. I don't know if you saw that uh, Nick Cannon. Um, did you hear about that? No. Oh. Yes, yes. Nick Cannon has gotten his, uh, his job back uh, after calling white people savages. Um, I can assure you that no, um, that if it, things were reversed, here's, here's what he said. The people that don't have melanin are, and I'm going to say this carefully, a little less. When they didn't have the power of the sun, it started to deteriorate them. So then they're acting out of fear. They're acting out of low self-esteem. They're acting out of a deficiency. So therefore, the only way that they can act is evil. They have to rob, steal, rape, kill in order to survive. So then these people that didn't have what we have, and when I say we, I speak of melanated people, they had to be savages. They're acting as animals, so they're the ones that are actually closer to animals. They're the ones that are actually the true savages. Yay. Um, but uh, he's getting uh, his uh, job back. I can assure you, had anything been said in the reverse, that never, ever, ever, ever would have been happen. Would happen. But here's the funny part. Here's the funny part. Uh, Ibram Kendi. Ibram X. Kendi. The biggest selling how to be an anti-racist um, person promoting critical race theory in all the government stuff. <laughs> uh, he got caught. Um, and, I, and I wish there was a... Uh, actually, I, wa I wanted to play it, um, but I, I, I can't. But um, speaking to the New York State Association of Independent Schools... Kendi called his daughter's recent announcement that she wanted to be a boy horrifying for he and his wife. And he said, and of course, you know, we're like, okay, what affirmative messages about girlhood, you know, can we be teaching her to protect her from whatever she's hearing in our home or even outside of our home that would make her want to be a boy? Um, well, the, the Super Bowl just happened had the worst ratings since the 1960s I didn't watch. it's because you didn't watch okay i didn't i didn't watch either but i i i did i wanted i wanted to see what was gonna happen for one reason anybody who's 43 years old you and i have got to be going yeah. dude <laughs> <laughs> old guys rule yeah so i love the pictures did you hear about deflate gate too Deflate Gate 2, they had a picture of, of Brady with a walker. And the question was, had he deflated the little tennis balls on the front of him to give himself an advantage? <laughs> I love it. Uh, it's like, yeah, <clears throat> okay. But uh, yeah, the old guys won again. Uh, so I, I like that. But anyways, uh, there was a streaker. Well, not a, really a streaker, but a weird dude who ran out on the field in the fourth quarter. Yeah. And somebody pointed out that like the Kansas City offense, he couldn't get into the end zone either because <laughs> he slid right before he got there. But um, the old, I forgot what the guy's name was. I, I, I saw it on Twitter. I commented on it. But a guy who's been calling NFL games forever starts calling the guy's run. And then he's saying, no, no, no. I said, uh, pull those pants up, boy. Pull, the, pull those, pull those, pull those, that pants. And I'm sitting here listening to this. It's be a man. He says, be a man. Pull those pants up. And I'm sitting here going, I wonder how long either his suspension's going to be or how many weeks he's going to have to be traveling around the United States apologizing for what Ibram Kendi also just did, where he said, because today, if your little girl comes home and says she wants to be a boy, you're supposed to go, oh, let's go get some test. What? Oh. I'm still here? You're still there. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, the new mics came today? We just, we're just not using them. Okay, great. We will next time. Anyway, hopefully what I was saying, you're not just seeing someone, you know, sitting there going like this in silence, but I just thought it was amazing um, that uh, <coughs> Ibram X. Kendi is guilty of transphobia. No, he's not. He's a dad. 
And what he said was perfectly right. He's wrong about everything else, but he was a dad. And the funny thing was, he saw the categories. Yeah, sure, he saw it in the context of race and all the rest of that stuff. But he knows what a boy is and he knows what a girl is. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, anyways. Um, <clears throat> Let's, let's just, how long did I go here? Uh, we've been going about uh, an hour. 30. Yeah, I, I think we've been going a little over an hour. L let me get to just, what? Five. Yeah, right. Uh, let me just get to um, one, uh, there, were, there was one other uh, screenshot that I wanted to look at. Uh, that's one I've already looked at, and I think this is, yeah. Again, this is, this is just hitting all, uh, Joe Lumen, by the way, Joe Lumen, every once in a while, poor girl, um, People get all upset with Joe Lumen. Joe Lumen is just your standard Union Theological Seminary type chick. Okay, this is this is just what it means to be an ultra leftist liberal in the in the world today. And I guess when I sat down, I messed everything up with my microphone. Maybe that's what's call, causing the cutout. Um, she's just your ultra left liberal. And so people jump on her all the time, and it's, it's like, come on, guys, this is just the way these people are. She, uh, she writes, being gay is not a sin, being trans is not a sin, being bi is not a sin, being queer is not a sin. A deity that creates LGBTQ plus people to call them sinners simply for being is a sadist and shouldn't be followed or worshipped. Also, that deity is just a projection of your bigotry. So we, we need to recognize that there is very, very plainly, um, clear, I think I messed up here, clear indication that Machen was right. Machen was right. Christianity, Christianity and liberalism, they're two different religions. They're two different religions. For Joe Lumen, what scripture says, what Jesus said, it doesn't matter. It's what culture says, and then you just take the Bible, and you, you know if there's parts you can fit in, great. If not, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But it's like this, she's not unusual. She is not unusual in any way, shape, or form. She's really not. She's really not. Um, now we got to look at that. There's one other one I want to get to real quick. Let me just mention, this is what I want to look at right here. Um, we'll finish up with this one, but let me just mention that right now, um, all other things being equal, and I remain healthy and things like that, Sunday night, I will be preaching at Apologia Church, and I will be addressing um, stuff that has been very, very much upon my mind for a number of years now, but especially in reference to the proper orientation of the church's purpose, especially in light of what's coming at us with a global socialist totalitarianism that is based upon secularism. It is a, it is a worldview that is the enemy of Christ. It's sad that we live in a day when so many Christians are uncomfortable with even using the term enemy of Christ because that's central to the biblical narrative. Um, what is the great prophetic passage in Psalm 110, and so your enemies made a footstool for your feet. Until, and what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? He must reign until all his enemies are put under his feet. Secularism is one of the greatest enemies to ever rear its head against Christ. Pagan Rome was not a secular state, but it had many things in common with a secular state. But full-on Darwinian secularism is truly an enemy of Christ. And how should we approach this? How should we look to the future? I'm going to be addressing those things Sunday night. Um, and normally we get started somewhere between 4.30 and 4.35 now. Um, our time, which is 6.30, 6.35 I think, Eastern Time on Facebook. If you look up Apologia Studios, you might find that sermon to be interesting. Let's finish up with a brief response to my friend Bassam Zawadi. Uh, Bassam and I uh, debated in London years ago, uh, and uh, I don't know that we'll ever get to do that again, at least in that format. Um, maybe in here, uh, be able to get to do that. 
But uh, Bassam is a Muslim. And I found this statement very interesting. I wanted to respond to it. Religions such as Christianity only enable its followers to extol their deity while they are praying and preaching. While Islam enables and offers its adherents a life permeating system of living suffused with glorifying God in every action they take. Now, I thought that most Christians might find this really interesting because it would help you to gain somewhat of an insight into uh, how Muslims think and especially how one such as Bassam, who is familiar with Christianity, uh, would, would view our faith. When, when the Muslim engages in their various activities during the day and they do so by saying certain things, doing their prayers, but wearing certain clothing and ordering their day in light of the prayers and um, acknowledging God in their activities, they believe that this has merit in the sight of God. And in fact, uh, it's well known that during the month of Ramadan, the month of fasting, uh, that there is something called Laylat al-Qadr, the night of power, uh, wherein it is believed that the prayers that you offer on Laylat al-Qadr, and no one knows exactly when Laylat al-Qadr is, it's one of the odd numbered days at the end of... Uh, 23rd, 25th, 27th um, of Ramadan. That's why you'll find all night prayer vigils and services in mosques um, during all those nights so that one of them is laid out al Qadr. Well, the prayers that you offer at that time, uh, Rich, is, uh, Rich is having uh, the cameras go crazy back there. Something went wrong, S so, something went wrong but everything is okay now. We're all fine here, all fine here now. Yeah. Now, you, now you can hear. What the things that, that I hear, only through the window. Um, anyway, uh, they, they meet on all those nights so that one of those nights is Layat al-Qadr, and so their pray, prayers will have so much more efficacy and value before Allah than prayers said any other night of the year, that they are willing to be up all night. Uh, it's not that they're not already up all night normally, because uh, the easiest way to get through all that fasting is to sleep during the day, which isn't always possible, but a lot of people will, and then eat all night. But anyway, uh, so the idea from an outsider looking at us is that the only time, and notice the language, religion such as Christianity only enable its followers to extol their deity while they are praying and preaching. Now, I, I don't expect... Basam Zawadi to be watching every edition of the Dividing Line or listening to my sermons. Right? I, I realize that's, that's not going to happen. But Basam, that's just simply not true. Um, fundamental Christian theology is that Christ, well, what, is, what does John chapter 14 tell us? That, that, that Jesus and the Father make their abode in us by the Spirit. And so, as spirit-indwelt believers, we are the body of Christ. So that, as Paul says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. The most menial task. You know, in, in, in Islam, you might think, well, the most menial task, we, we dedicate it to the service of Allah. Okay, the Christian does everything to the glory of Christ, indwelt by the Spirit of God. So all of life, whatever you do, do all things to the glory of God in Jesus Christ. We are told that Christ is in all and is uh, the whole purpose for the entirety of our life. We can, where we differ, is that what we do, we do only because we are prompted by that spirit whom we have by grace. It's not that we demonstrate something to God. We aren't saved by good works. We do good works to demonstrate our love for the one who has saved us. And so faith out works is dead. That's true. God, is, God, is, God has chosen his people. He, he makes them alive so that we might, as Paul put it in Ephesians chapter 2, 
He, he created us unto good works that we might walk in them. That might, might be the very pattern of our life. So I'm not sure where you've gotten this idea that the only time we can extol their deity uh, is while praying and preaching because Christian literature is filled with how the, the godly mother raising her children and providing for her family and cleaning the home is worshiping God in a, in a pure and wonderful way, only in and through Jesus Christ, but a pure and wonderful way. So I understand what the Muslim thinks about, you know, if I say these prayers and if I uh, do the things that I do uh, that acknowledge throughout the day that a law exists, then I am... Uh, living a life permeating system of living suffused with glorifying God in every action they take. Um, that is not unique to Islam by any stretch of the imagination. And I would think, Basam, that you would have read enough of the New Testament that you would have read the entirety of the New Testament. I've read the Quran multiple times, and uh, I know the Quran's longer, uh, the New Testament is longer than the Quran, but, but certainly it's worth getting through it once. Um, makes that point very, very plainly, very, very plainly. So I would, I would invite you to take another look at it and reconsider uh, that uh, in, uh, in taking a look at it. All right. Well, I hope that that was uh, useful. To, I hope you all see why um, we did what we did in coming in here. Um, I wanted to really just lay it down as a, as a firm foundation this is what these texts are about, and these people are propounding lies. How many of them know their lies? I don't know. But they're propounding lies. I wasn't talking about Basam there at the end. I was talking about the issue of homosexuality. Um, this stuff is all over the Internet. And Christian parents, your children need to know what the truth about these things is. They really do, and that means you need to know it. You need to know it firmly, and not just, well, I have a URL I can send you to. No, we need to know. We need to know. All right, thanks for watching The Dividing Line today. I now say, Lord willing, if we are allowed to be back with you ever again in the future, we'll see you then. Otherwise, continue to live in the light of the empty tomb. God bless.